Hello. Uh, today we will be learning about uh, physical science. So just a lesson summary, uh, you will be learning about five main topics associated with physical science. Waves, sound, light, temperature, and heat. The skills acquired are going to be identifying and learning definitions of those five main topics, uh, basics and properties for each topic, in-depth analysis of each topic, and solving example problems. So let's get started. First, waves. What is a wave? A wave is a disturbance that travels through a medium from one place to another. Um, there's a PBS video, uh, multiple videos in the bottom, um, if you wanted to take a look at those as well, just to get a little more deeper understanding about waves. So the basics of waves. A wave's natural position is known as equilibrium or rest position, right? Uh, you've probably heard of rest before, maybe equilibrium is a new word. Um, no, think of the word uh, equal, right? Um, it's sort of how I think about it, you know, the same. Um, the act of moving an object in a given direction and returning it to its start position is the disturbance, right? Or waves are those disturbances, right? And we, we can look at the bottom and we can look at a slinky, for instance. Uh, when a slinky is stretched, the individual coils assume an equilibrium or rest position, right? You can stretch out a slinky and that will be it. However, when the first coil of the slinky is repeatedly vibrated back and forth, a, a disturbance is created which travels through the slinky from one end to the other. Now, you probably have done this before, right? You could have seen, you know, you could have maybe get one of those massive slinkies, put it on one step and have it go down like this, a staircase. Um, or you could just play with a slinky in your hands. See, you know, if you move one, you know, the whole thing will move, right? Just like, you know, if you're using ropes, you know, you shake one end of the rope, the, the vibration um, and disturbance will travel through that whole rope, right? It, it, it's a, a chain reaction has occurred. So what is a medium? Uh, is a medium is a substance or material that carries a wave. Um, it's a collection of interacting particles. So down below in that picture, we can see that a medium can be modeled by a series of particles connected by a string. Um, and as one particle is displayed, the string attached to the next is stretched and begins to exert a force on its neighbor thus displacing the neighbor from its rest position. So what does that mean? That means that, right, if I, uh, if I, like I said before, like if I have, if I'm holding one end of the slinky and I start, you know, um, you know, just moving my hand uh, up, up and down, it'll create a whole wave. Um, and maybe you've done this, you know, like in the pool, for instance, right? You, you know, splash the water, you can see the ripple effect. Um, you know, uh, you know, it uh, goes uh, going outwards, um, things like that. Maybe, you know, jumping onto, you know, like a, a water bed or something like that, something where you can see the, vis the visible uh, vibrations uh, that you see going outwards from that point of origin. Uh, so understanding waves. Waves tra transport energy, not matter. That's very important. Uh, they do not transport matter. They transport energy. Uh, a force will always return the particles to their original position. The particles interact adjacent to each other, right? So we see that slinky down below. It's not that um, I'm moving my, you know, if I move one end of the slinky, it's not like you won't see uh, vibrations, but then you'll see, you know, the end of the slinky move, right? No, you, you, the vibrations uh, and, you know, the interactions are adjacent, which means that adjacent means that they're next to each other, right? The neighbors, um, you can see that first one, then the second one, then the third one, you can see the progression of these waves happening. So some properties of waves, and there's a, you know, some interactive, uh, there's an interactive website up top if you want just to further your learning. Um, 
uh, so what are the properties of waves, right? Well, this, that graph that, you know, um, maybe you're familiar with a cosine graph. Uh, I don't expect you to be, but that's what it would look like. Uh, just those up and down um, motion. Uh, so let, let's analyze this, right? From the top, so the, the top is called the crest, right? The, that arrow at the top, that red arrow at the top points to the crest, right? That's, that's the name for the apex, you know, the highest point of a wave. Mm -hmm. And on the bottom is a trough. And that is the lowest point. You can't go further than that lowest point. So a wavelength is the distance from crest to crest, right? Uh, that green line right there. Uh, saying distance from crest to crest, right? From one, one top to the other top. Or a wavelength can be the distance from trough to trough, right? It could be the distance from the bottom to bottom or top to top. Either way, it's the same thing. It's, a, it's the same distance, excuse me. Um, a period is the time between uh, the passage of successive crests, right? The time it takes for the whole wavelength to travel is, is called that period. The frequency is the number of crest passages per unit of time, right? If we want to somehow measure that, uh, we can see you know, that frequency is represented by that V with that uh, blue line right there. And the number of times you could just count or you could do, you know, there's mathematical ways to figure out the frequency and period and you know, other things as well. Um, but just to know what frequency is. And lastly, amplitude is the distance from level of crest to level of trough. When, and what that is saying, right, you can see those two A's. If we have that dashed line going straight through the middle, right, it's that dashed line going downwards to the trough or that dashed line going up to the crest, right, that, that halfway distance, right? Technically, if we add those two amplitudes right there, that would be, you know, the, the from, crest to trough, you know, that horse, that, excuse, excuse me, that vertical line. And uh, that would be that amplitude, right? That, that distance in between. As you can also see, the speed of light uh, is the rate of motion of crest or troughs. Uh, and you can see that direction of speed of light is pointing to the right. So the wavelength is traveling to the right. And this motion, this, this wave is not stopping right there. This wave is continuously going and going and going uh, out to the right as that sp speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second. So the difference between mechanical and electromagnetic waves. So mechanical waves travel through a medium while electromagnetic waves travel through a vacuum. And you've probably heard of mechanical, uh, mechanical and electromagnetic waves before, right? Electromagnetic uh, spectrum you've probably heard of, right? You know, gamma rays, you know, radio waves, microwaves, um, you know, x-rays, uh, UV rays, uh, things like that, um, you know, you definitely uh, have heard of maybe you've gotten an x-ray before and not even realized that's an electromagnetic wave um, versus this mechanical waves, right? Uh, and you can see in that picture uh, that waves, you know, the sound waves that are traveling to someone's ear. Um, and you can see the, those are called longitudinal waves and that compression refraction. So, Uh, longitudinal waves or particles are parallel to the direction of wave propagation, the, w the way the waves travel. Propagation is the way waves travel. Oscillation motion versus propagation, right? And we can see this interactive uh, little, um, this interactive wave at the bottom, right? If, if we follow the, a particle, right? The waves are traveling to the right, right? And these particles, they're going back and forth, you know, left to right. And we can see this compression and re refraction, right? 
as it moves towards the right, right? If we really watch the particles, the particles are only going to the left and to the right, and they're, pr they're pretty stagnant also, right? You, you don't see them going with the waves or anything. They're just staying there. Versus what we'll see in the next slide are transverse waves, right? These transverse waves are particles are perpendicular to the direction of wave propagation, right? The way the waves moves the way the waves move, excuse me, and the particles don't move. Instead, they just go up and down, up and down. And you can see that, right? The particles aren't going left to right. They're going north to south if we want to use, you know, directions um, like that. Uh, you can see like a particle will only go up and down, up and down, up and down, uh, really not making that much movement. Um, you know, a particle will just keep following its same path, that short little pass up and down. Um, it will never go left to right. Um, so this is probably one of the most common are water waves, right? You pro you've probably seen waves in the ocean, um, waves before, you know, may maybe you made your own waves. Um, but water waves are a combination of longitudinal and transverse uh, motions, right? It's, they travel in clock, count, clockwise circles, excuse me, they travel in clockwise circles. And what you can see right now is that these, these particles are moving both, you know, up and down, but they're also moving left to right. And this is where you get this um, very, this nice illusion that you can see of these waves, right? Um, if, if you follow, right, if you follow the, that uh, orange circle, right? We follow one of those particles. You can see that that particle is in fact only moving in a circle, okay? We can see that in the smaller orange one also, but you can see that in fact they're only moving in a circle. You, it looks like the particles are traveling right to the right, um, but they're actually just moving up. They're moving in a clockwise circle. It's very fascinating, this illusion. Right, and as you get further and further down, it's harder and harder to see that clockwise motion. It's hard to see the those particles moving, but you you can see a little bit of the movement. But it is very fascinating to see that the particles are just moving in circles, and what, how they all because they all move in that circle, they create this illusion of this wave traveling left to right and forming those little crests and troughs and a uh, wave like a uh, pattern. So second, right? Sound. So what are sounds? Sound, sound waves are longitudinal waves that travel through a medium, such as air or water, right? That's a picture of sound waves right down there, right? And you've probably heard that from speakers, right? You know, uh, you know, if you get those expensive speakers, you can even see like when uh, the beats travel and sort of you can feel the vibrations um, and, you know, the speakers can go very loud and travel sound waves very far. Um, so the basics of sound, sound is the transfer of energy from a vibrating object in waves that travel through matter. All sound waves start with, uh, with vibrations. Metals are a good conductor of sound. So good conductor means that they carry, um, uh, they carry sound very well. Um, that conductor means you know, that they're suitable to carry sound. Uh, and sound waves mainly travel in air, but they can also travel in liquids and solids. Example, hearing sirens inside, right? Let's say you're inside your house and you hear a fire truck go by, right? You hear the sirens of a fire truck. Well, how are you able to hear that fire truck if you're inside, right? It's because sound can actually travel through solids. They can travel through walls. They can travel through uh, space. And that's the, that's the reason why you can hear it. Um, and to the right, we can hear, uh, excuse me, to the right, we can see, uh, you know, a guitar, right? If you play the guitar, you have these, you're producing these sound waves and creating these vibrations, right? If you pluck a, a guitar string, it vibrates back and forth extremely quickly. Sometimes you can't even see it that quick. And the, the vibrating air particles pass the energy of the vibrations away from the string in waves, right? It's very important. Remember, and one of the key things about this presentation is that waves 
transports energy, not matter. It's very important to understand that. And this is what this guitar here is doing. The energy is being transferred by this vibration. Um, excuse me, by this vibration, and you can hear it through uh, the. Uh, you can hear it by your ear, and that is that is how uh, you, uh, you can hear a uh, guitar. So understanding sound a little bit better, right? Sounds, sound waves are longitudinal waves. There is no sound in a vacuum. And this is going back to that siren, right? If we hear sirens and they echo outwards, they can be hear, you can hear it through air, you can hear it through water, but it's much, much harder to hear it through water. Uh, and uh, you can see that nice little visual representation of sound. Some information about sound waves. Every sound we hear is produced by vibrations, right? You've probably heard of that word vibrations before, um, but this is some good context for it now. These vibrations create sound waves, right? Move in, they move in all directions, right? They come in, the, it's not just one narrow path. They, they just spread out and they just go outwards and outwards and outwards. The disturbance moves in the same direction as the wave as well. So what is frequency, right? I, I mentioned that word frequency a little bit earlier, um, but what is it, right? The frequency is the number of compressions or rarefactions that pass a point in a fixed amount of time. And we can see that there. We can see the wavelength, right? We can see from compression to compression or rarefaction to rarefaction on both wavelengths. And we can see how, you know, when you compress it, you think of compressing compression like compressing, right? It's getting closer and closer together while the opposite is getting further and further and stretching and stretching it out and out. So calculations to find sound waves. Um, you can calculate uh, how to find sound waves. It is very complex. Um, right down there uh, is just what it is, but I, I want to pay more attention about uh, this the actual picture, right, the speed of sound, we can see that this sound wave is traveling outwards and outwards in the circular path in all directions. And it's going in the same direction as the vibrations and the disturbance, right? We can see those arrows going out and out. And it's going all, all in the same direction. So what is velocity? Well, velocity equals the wavelength times the frequency, right? If we want to find the speed of this wavelength, uh, I mean, of this sound wave, we would calculate the wavelength and calculate the frequency, and that would give us the velocity, right? And we can manipulate that equation as well. And down below is a little picture, right? You, you can see, maybe you've heard of, you know, for every second uh, you hear a lightning strike, that's it's one mile away, right? And that's what that's showing you right there. Um, you know, for every, when you hear thunder, you can, you can calculate how far away it is from your location approximately, right? If you count eight seconds, well, it's eight miles away. That's because it travels in that same direction. Um, and you can see that. Uh, pitch. You've probably heard of this word pitch before, right? Uh, uh, especially if you like to sing. Uh, pitch is the closer the particles are, the higher the amplitude is, right? And we can see those uh, pitches down below, right? That small amplitude is quieter. That louder amplitude is, has a larger amplitude. And those lower and higher pitches as well. Um, some, just some graphs of them. Uh, and you can see that amplitude, how it affects it as well. So scaling sound waves. So there's many different ways we can scale the sound waves, right? Hertz is the units that we measure sound waves in. Um, so we have infrared, infrared sound, infrasound, um, which is below 20 hertz. Audible, which is between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. And then ultrasound, which is over 20k hertz, right? 
20,000 hertz. Above that will be ultrasound. So those are the, that's how we would scale sound. All right, so let's go, which ultrasound versus infrasound, right? And we can see that sound waves with a frequency too low for the human ear to hear are called infrasound, right? That's, you can't even hear these sounds and uh you know but other animals other other um things can hear them uh animals such as whales elephants or hippopotamus use infrasound to communicate over distance uh you may have heard of uh you know whales um you know you you may have heard of those noises before how they you can hear the that noise and it's, sometimes it's like that echo underwater um which is you know below 20 hertz uh, then in the middle is the human, where the humans can hear. And then higher of that is where animals such as dogs, bats, birds, and insects can hear ultrasound, right? That, that, that's a picture of that bat, um, and that's how they communicate. Uh, sound waves with the, those infrasounds are sound waves with a frequency too high for the human ear to, to hear are called ultrasounds. And you can see that where where we are in that uh, spectrum. Third, third is light. So what is light? Light is a broad spectrum of radiant energy, right? Is the electromagnetic spectrum shows the range of light. So light in the world, right? Light light comes from the sun, right? You probably uh maybe know that uh, already from science class, right? Light comes from the sun and sustains both human and animal life on Earth, right? How does light do that? Well, you know, you probably, maybe you've heard of the word photosynthesis before. That is how animal, that is how plants produce their food and how they survive. Well, oh, excuse me. Well, they get that light from the from the sun, right? The sun produces, you know, it helps them create glucose and that it helps them survive. So light interacting with matter helps shape the universe, right? Light, in, light, you know, form the forest, you know, it provides humans with oxygen. Light is the reason why humans and animals can survive on Earth. So the basics of light. Light is a transverse electromagnetic wave, right? right? That, that sounds a little bit much at first, but uh, we will dissect that later. Um, and can be seen by the human light human eye excuse me uh you you see light all the time you know you turn on the lights multiple times a day right uh you can you obviously can see light uh, light can also travel through a vacuum as well and that those are some pictures of light down below so how is light produced right there's incandescent light and there's luminescence um, right, one is the emission of light from hot matter, temperature greater than 800K, or the emission of light when ele excited electrons fall to lower energy levels, or the other two different types. Uh, you've probably heard of that word luminescence before. Right, what is the speed of light? Light in a vacuum is denoted as C. And that is a fixed value of 299,792,458 meters per second. Light, in a vat, light, the speed of light in medium is less than the speed of light in the vacuum. And the, the medium of light weighs determines that speed, right? So because, because, um, uh, because depending on the medium and where that light is traveling on will depend on how fast it goes. That is why the vacuum is faster than the medium. Down there is even a picture you can see, you know, the remnants of a picture of cars traveling. So what are some characteristics of light? Light has, you know, there's two common characteristics is this intensity and its brightness. So you probably heard of this word brightness before. It's a relative intensity by the human eye, right? How how bright something is is how how much light it's producing, right? Uh, and the intensity is the absolute measure of a light in of a light density, right? Uh, we probably you probably used that word brightness before, maybe not even understanding the 
scientific context of that term. Right. But the brightness, you know, how bright your room is right now or things like that. So this is the electromagnetic spectrum. You may have heard of this before, right? It, going from highest to lowest, right? We have gamma rays, x-rays, UV, visible, infrared, microwaves, and radio waves, right? So let's, let's talk about them. Let's talk about these uh, different ways, right? Microwaves, right? We use microwaves all the time. You've, you've probably even heard that... Um, when you're cooking something in the microwave, you should not be standing in front of the microwave. And that is because those microwaves use those uh, different uh, waves and it's, it's not healthy to have those waves just to, be, uh, to travel to you uh, too much. Uh, same can go for x-rays, right? You wear protective gear if you've ever you know, broken an arm or, th or uh, had to check if you need to get an x-ray. Uh, they're very careful only to take a picture of the specific part and to leave the your leave your other parts uh, untouched by the waves because too too much uh, too much of the electromagnetic spectrum too many of these waves can cause uh, dangerous things such as cancer and things like that. Uh, you you've also probably used you know you've probably heard of infrared light you know you you'll see military people you know they use scopes. Uh, that are infrared that you know can detect uh, heat temperature, so they can detect you know uh, human body temperature, um, things like that. UV light, uh, you know, so th light from the sun. Um, yeah, gamma rays are obviously the highest, and then also those radio waves. You know, using a radio that you know radios. You know, to get them to your car, that's how they transport. Uh, energy uh how they transport that energy and how you're able to hear you know those large radio towers uh also that visible light uh you will see another picture but it's violet blue blue green green yellow green yellow orange red uh we can see that and i'll explain that later in one second right but that is the length oh excuse me wavelength uh right of this visible light. So the three main properties of light. Light can either absorb, reflect, or transmit, right? So absorption is the when the electrons with the same vibrational frequencies and they transform into motion. Reflection is opaque objects cause electron vibrations not to pass completely. And term, transmission, transparent objects cause electron vibrations to pass and re-emit. Right, and if you if you think if you understand the actual these words absorption, right, to absorb something, to reflect and transmit, you know, if you understand those those words just contextually, then you'll understand it in the in the terms of light as well. So this is where I'm going back to the these that uh, visible light, and we'll see it on the next picture, on the next few slides as well. So mono chromatic light versus polychromatic light. So what, what I talked about prefixes in a different slide, but mono, you, you may already know, means one, and poly means more than one, right? Multiple, right? So only one frequency, chromatic, right, uh, would mean frequency in this term. So if, if we have, you know, one and frequency, that's how you get that uh, definition. And some examples would be of monochromatic light. It would be laser light, for instance, right? You know, if you've ever used a laser before. Or white light is polychromatic light. You can see all those white light transfers and you can see a rainbow on the other side. And um, we'll talk about this rainbow right now, right? A rainbow, uh, light is a collection of colors. Therefore, white light on side of a prism creates a rainbow on the other side, which is crazy, right? Re refractive index is the causes light to bend. Uh, the angle of bending depends on the light's origin. And the color of light are red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, right? How, how do I know that so easily? It's because Roy G. Biv. If you've not heard of that before, Roy G. Biv, you, you definitely will learn that uh, very soon. Roy G. Biv is, you know, a rainbow is um, 
the collection of light and it's just a known term uh, that uh, is used, right? And this is that picture of Roy G. Bibb. We have this white light. It looks completely white on that side, but it's actually not. And when it's reflected, we can see this colorful rainbow, right? Starting from red, starting from red, going to orange, then yellow, then green, then blue, then indigo, then violet. We can see that. And you've probably seen rainbows before, but that's, it's honestly, a rainbow is just white light, right? It's, it's that reflection, the, the way the angle is bending, um, that light and it can produce this different light. So let's move on to temperature. Temperature is the average kinetic energy of the particles of matter. And below is, you know, thermostat, uh, um, sorry, uh, a way to measure your temperature. Uh, if you've ever been sick before, you've probably used it. Um, uh, and there's different ways to do that as well. So what high temperature versus low temperature. The faster the particles move, the more kinetic energy they have. Therefore, the temperature will be higher, right? So if something's quick moving, right, the particles are uh, chaotic, the more kinetic energy they'll have and they'll have a higher uh, temperature, right? But the opposite, right, is for lower temperature. The lower the particles move, the less kinetic energy they have. Therefore, the temperature will be lower. Looking at the particles, right? The gas particles on the right have more kinetic energy than those on the left. So the gas on the right is at a higher temperature, right? Look, look how fast the ones on the right are moving. You, you can barely even see them moving so quickly, but the left don't look like they're moving that quickly. Uh, so that obviously shows that they have a lower temperature than the ones to the right. Uh, there's three ways to measure that temperature, Kelvin, Celsius, and Fahrenheit. Uh, Kelvin's units are K, Celsius is you know, that degree with the C, and the Fahrenheit is that degree with a, a with a F. Uh, Kelvin, just as a side note, starts at an absolute zero or infinite cold. So boiling point versus freezing point. Uh, the boiling point is when liquid changes into a vapor, while freezing point is when a liquid changes into a solid. And that is important to know, right? If if you've a uh, boiling point, right, we can see that water is heating up on that left-hand side and will eventually uh, become into vapor. But you can see it's getting trapped at the top. Uh, and freezing point is, you know, the opposite. When, you know, zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit uh, is when um, – it becomes ice, the temperature at which water changes from a liquid to a solid. And you've probably heard, right, uh, you know, if it's under 32 degrees Fahrenheit, well, then it's uh, snow can form, right? And that's because uh, it's, you know, it can be that solid instead of that liquid rain. So the freezing point versus boiling point again, uh, the freezing point of water in the different Kelvin Celsius and Fahrenheit is 273 Kelvin, zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, while the boiling point is 373 Kelvin, 100 degrees Celsius, and 212 degrees Fahrenheit. How do thermometers measure temperature? Well, the liquid fluctuates inside the glass tube as the temperature changes. Right, that red liquid in the thermometer is alcohol. The, al the alcohol expands uniformly over a wide range of temperatures. This makes it ideal for its uses in th thermometers, right? And we can see that in those th thermometers, excuse me. So converting Celsius to Fahrenheit, right? We can look at that formula right there. That is the common formula. We have some degrees Celsius multiplied by 
plus 32 will equal degrees Celsius, right? So let's have an example of 25 degrees Celsius. So how we, and we want to know how many degrees Fahrenheit this will equal. Well, what we have to do is 25 multiplied by 1.8 plus 32. So 25 multiplied by 1.8 is 45. So 45 plus 32 is 77 degrees Fahrenheit. So let's try converting Celsius to Kelvin. But to convert Celsius to Kelvin, it's degrees of the Celsius plus 273 equaling Kelvin, right? Technically, it's 273.15, but we can round these numbers, right? And we have degrees, and we want to know how many, how much 50 degrees Celsius will be in Kelvin. Well, we'll all we have to do is just add 50 to 273, and that gives us 323 degrees. I mean, 323 Kelvin, right? Converting Fahrenheit now to Celsius is... The, the Fahrenheit subtracted by 32 divided by 1.8 equaling degrees Celsius, right? The opposite of going from Celsius uh, to Fahrenheit, um, right? We, we saw that was, you know, adding the 32 and then, I mean, excuse me, uh, multiplying the 1.8 and adding the 32. Now it's, you know, we subtract the 32 and divide the 1.8. So for instance, let's say we have 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and we want to know how many degrees Celsius that is. Well, uh, we have 86 minus 32 gives us 54. Divide that by 1.8, and that gives us 30. And the, my, my suggestion for this is, you know, memorize one of them. And if you memorize one of them, you'll be able to understand the others at, at least better. Um, and, you know, you could back solve if you needed to or, you know, my only suggestion would have been then just be to memorize it. Um, uh, maybe, you know, in the future, you may start rounding this, right? You could use 30 instead of 32 and then 2 instead of 1.8, and it'll give you about the same numbers. Uh, so converting Fahrenheit to Kelvin, that formula is the Fahrenheit plus 460 rounded, uh, multiplied by 5 ninths, right? And this this is a little bit more complex maybe you need a calculator for this but we have five degrees fahrenheit let's say and we want to know the kelvin uh so five plus 460 uh, multiplied by five ninths so we have 465 multiplied by five ninths and that gives us 258.333 repeated kelvin now we have converting kelvin to celsius uh, Kelvin minus 273 equaling the degrees of Celsius, right? Example, we have 300 Kelvin equaling how much Celsius? Well, 300 minus 273 equaling 27 degrees Celsius. And also converting Kelvin to Fahrenheit, finally, we have 900, uh, excuse me, 9, nine fifths. K minus 460 equaling Fahrenheit. So let's let's say we have 100 uh, Kelvin. We want to find out the Fahrenheit. We do 9 fifths multiplied by 100, subtract 460. So we have 180 minus 460 equaling negative 280 degrees Fahrenheit. And the last topic for today will be heat. Heat is a transfer of energy from a warm object to a cooler object, right? If we want to simplify right there. And we can see heat right there, right? We can see different forms of heat, right? The sun, a fire uh, from a pie, horseshoe, you know, melting, melting metal, you know, shaping, uh, you know, gold or silver or copper or anything like that, you know, roasting that marshmallow or, you know, transfers of heat. So all matter contains heat energy, even volcanoes and ice. Everything contains heat. Uh, it's, it's important to understand that, right? Um, you know, even something cold will have heat. And you can see that picture of that volcano right there. So a little intro to heat. Heat energy is formed by the movement of atoms, right? An atom is the basic unit of a chemical element. 
objects transfer heat to change temperatures. You can see that Bunsen burner or uh, or maybe just an oven, um, uh, you know, heating an object up. So heat energy is also known as thermal energy, uh, which is the movement of atoms uh, creates the thermal energy that is in everything, right? We can see heat energy in a solid is pretty compact uh, with not much movement and a liquid a little bit more movement, um, not too much still, but then gas, we have this chaotic, uh, erratic uh, movement uh, that is all over the place. You know, those particles are constantly moving. Um, and we can see there's different states of matter, the solid, liquid, and gas, how those different heat, uh, how the, the heat differs in each, um, in each state of matter. So heat with particles, right? At the higher temperatures, the particles have more thermal energy. The particles, the quicker particles can excite adjacent particles, right? And we can see that in that gas, right? The, in that liquid, it's, it's not, not as excited, right? I, I like that term, excited. But then in those gas particles, you can see how excited they are. They're moving rapidly. They're moving all over the place, you know? Uh, there's, you can just see them just constantly going all over the place. And um, that, that's what happens with those higher particles. Um, heat melting is the heat destroying the bonds of particle of moving particles, causing a change of states of matter, liquid to solid. The the heat destroyed, um, right? So we can think of ice being melted down, right? The ice is changing from a solid to a liquid, uh, and that that's caused by heat, right? We if we can if we melt a piece of ice, right, through heat. It's changing from a solid to a liquid. Evaporation is when the heat destroyed uh, the bonds of moving particles more so cause a change of states of matter from the liquid to a gas. And we can see that picture down below, right? Of, you know, heat from the sun, heat energy from the sun, right? That thermal energy uh, causes the ocean to get warmed up. And by the ocean being warmed up, this causes evaporation, right? The water, this is about the water cycle. The water then, the water, uh, from the ocean starts can evaporate and goes up and rises into water vapor and will be stored into clouds and those clouds will eventually then rain and uh, will bring it back down and that creates that cycle. Uh, so how to transfer this heat, right? There's three different ways to transfer the heat, convection, conduction, and radiation. Right in this image, we can see all three of them. We can see that convection, conduction, and radiation. Uh, radiation from that fire burning that water, uh, the conduction uh, from that handle and the convection from that water, you know, stirring all around. So that I really do like that picture. And if you are confused on how to transfer heat, just look at this picture for sure. Right, so what is convection? Convection transfers thermal energy through gases and liquids. And convection current is that circular flow of cold air rising and warm air dropping, right? We can see that picture there. If, if you, oh, excuse me. If you want to go back to this picture of convection, uh, we can see how, you know, that, that, war, that cold water is then transferring to that bottom heat water. And you can see that little current traveling in that little circular motion right there. You know, that, that bottom is a lot, is more heated and that heated water is starting to go up and that cold water is starting to go down and they're mixing. You can see that convection. Uh, the second one is conduction, the transfer of thermal energy into solids, right? We can see that Bunsen burner and uh, heat that fire heating up that metal, right? The warm particles directly transfer to increase the colder particles. Lastly, we have uh, radiation, which is uh, doesn't need particles to transfer heat, right? That fire is transporting that heat through the air to someone's hands, right? It's, it's transferred by infrared uh, waves. Uh, which we had talked about earlier, right? Which can be either absorbed or reflected. The fire heats up by conve uh, convection, right? <laughs> right. So it, it, you can see, you know, convection and radiation in that same picture, right? That the fire's uh, heated up by convection and that radiation is traveling to someone's hands. Uh, expansion is when an object that's heated, it will, it will obviously expand. <laughs> uh, uh, 
and I don't, I don't, I'm, I didn't mean to say obviously. I meant to uh, say that uh, it will expand. Uh, how about that? Um, and if a house is burning, the windows explode and burst away due to the high pressure. And we can see that from this image right there um, of those windows burning. A uh, little coffee experiment also, and there's a video with a link of extra experiments. Is So we know the heat is the flow of energy from a high temperature location to a low temperature lo location, right? And heating up, uh, so when when we have the coffee and we put it in, in um, you know, if we put it in the cup, uh, we can just, um, and we put it on the table, right? Uh, the the and stirring the coffee around, we can make the coffee cooler, or you know the same with uh, cola, right? We putting that water in, right? That transferring of cooler and warmer. Uh, another perspective on the experiment, right? What is this with the spoon? The spoon was cool before, and then we put the spoon uh, heats up quickly, making its particles move faster, temperature decreases, right? And there's the Bill Nye, the Science Guy video up top. But when we think about it, right, we stir that coffee around, what is, what's that doing? Well, it's, it's laying air into the coffee. Um, but what we're also doing is that heat from the coffee is transferring to that metal spoon and that, that spoon gets hot, but that makes now the uh, coffee get a little colder because this, the spoon transfers that cold uh, heat also to um, that cold energy to the uh, coffee as well. So new, what, what, this is a little more complex, but Newton's law of cooling states that the rate of change of temperature of an object is proportional to the distance of an object's temperature and surrounding temperature, right? I don't expect uh, you all to understand that right away. It's sort of, uh, Newton's law of cooling is sort of that explanation of that experiment before in more technical terms that you will learn about later. I just thought I would get you a little more used to that term. Uh, and thermal equilibrium is when a whole system has the same temperature, right? Equilibrium, we talked about, um, right? Equal, uh, you know, that rests the same. So an example, you know, putting ice in a drink, right? The ice is cold, the drink is warm. The heat is transferred from the drink to the ice, to water, to the, to the warm ice, excuse me. Uh, the ice in the drink will become the same temperature, right? That is what happens uh, eventually, you know, and you'll see that ice eventually melt uh, in a drink, right? All that cold energy, uh, that the, the, the warmer energy uh, overpower that colder energy as, they, as it disperses and uh, the drink becomes colder due to the ice. So a little bit about myself. My name is Aiden Silverman, and I live in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm a junior at Boys Latin. I love to play sports, especially soccer and lacrosse. And my sites uh, that I use here on this slide, if you just want to take an extra look and enhance your learning. So thank you.